I'm Sam Branson. Adventure runs in my blood. I've been lucky enough to travel the world and see nature in its extreme. I'm fascinated with how violent our planet can be. So I'm heading to a high altitude front line to investigate the power of winter. The slope shatters like a pane of glass. It's like thunder. The whole mountain just rumbles. I'm going into the wilds of the Rockies to test the technology that battles mountains of snow. And meet people who survived a brutal roller coaster ride. Snow was going over top of me and I couldn't see anything. I'll discover how hard it is to rescue someone from an avalanche. I think I got him, guys. We need to get him out fast. And experience what it's like to be buried alive. His uh, heart rate's going up, it's 93. If I tell him to take a deep breath, I can feel the snow impacting on my lungs. Winter in the Rocky Mountains of Utah, USA. Massive dumps of snow and nothing unusual here. Snow like this, though, can cause chaos. Recently, it seems like our winters are getting more intense. We've all seen how cities and airports around Europe and the US have been brought to a standstill from only a few hours of snow. Cities like New York, London and Chicago have been experiencing savage snowstorms over the last couple of years. On February the 1st, 2011, Chicago received an amazing 20 inches of snow in less than 24 hours. And on that same day, more than 50% of the landmass of the United States was blanketed white. Thousands of flights were cancelled, hundreds of schools closed, and countless cars abandoned. Now, just imagine if we had to deal with snow like this every winter. Heavy snow tests our ability to adapt. Our modern world often struggles to pass this freezing examination. What ingenuity, what technology do we have to meet this challenge? If we are in for a spell of extreme winters, how are we going to cope? How are we going to keep our world moving? London Heathrow, December the 18th, 2010. Just an hour of snow crippled one of the world's busiest airports for four days. But airports next to high mountain ranges have to handle heavy snowfall all the time. I've just landed at Salt Lake City International in Utah. Here, they get six to seven feet of snow each winter. Salt Lake City gets all this snow because it's 4,300 feet above sea level and slap bang next to some huge mountains, the Wasatch Range of the Rockies. When it starts to snow at the airport, powerful plane de-icing machines spring into action. Then they unleash their big guns. These 60-foot-long machines are the latest in snow technology. Each plough with its broom and blower can clear 500 tonnes of snow per hour. $24 million of specialised equipment to battle the elements. I've joined lead snowplough driver Harvey Murphy. Is there a lot of pressure on you guys to make sure the uh, runways are clear? You know, absolutely, that's our job. That's what we're here for. That's what we're getting paid for. When planes are stacking up in the sky, waiting for a runway to be cleared of snow, all eyes are on these plow drivers. It's a big responsibility in trying to get it open. You know, they're up there, they want to get down. A lot of them only have so much fuel, they don't want it to burn. When you have a heavy snow, it's like everything hits you at once. It's a constant battle, really, isn't it? It is constant. And and it's never, it's never really the same battle. Every storm is different. You know, all the conditions vary from storm to storm, so you have to be able to uh, adapt and change and be able to move with the storm. Uh, 
runway 16 is clear of snow now, thanks to these snowplow teams. It was amazing being in Salt Lake City Airport and seeing the operation they've got going there. It's just unbelievable the amount of manpower and machine power they've got going and the organisation that's gone into keeping that airport open during, during snowy weather. Heavy snowfall at an airport can ground planes, but when it's dumped on top of a mountain, it takes on a whole new terrifying dynamic. Add gravity in a steep slope, and you have all the ingredients for a killer, the avalanche. Thousands of tons of snow crashing down a mountainside at speeds of more than 100 miles per hour. Every year, avalanches kill and injure hundreds of people around the world, and the numbers are rising. Near Chamonix in the French Alps, 12 people were killed in 1999 when a massive slide smashed through these buildings. In February 2010, 166 people were killed by a devastating avalanche that struck the Salang Pass of Afghanistan. And in the United States, avalanches now kill five times as many people as they did 40 years ago. How does man contend with this lethal form of snow? I want to learn more and ultimately test myself against this deadly force of nature. So I'm leaving Utah, making for the San Juan Mountains of Southern Colorado. It's an eight hour drive. Early next morning, I've arrived. It's an intimidating landscape. On my uh, left-hand side, there's dramatically steep mountains. It's quite hard to see in this visibility. And to my right, there's stomach-churningly steep drops, and it sort of brings home to you how dangerous this road actually is. It's said to be the most dangerous road for avalanches in the whole of North America. This is the fearsome Highway 550 in Colorado. It goes right through Silverton, one of the highest towns in the United States. Here, they know all about the dangers of snow. Silverton's residents live at an altitude of 9,300 feet. Threatening avalanche chutes loom above the rooftops. I'm going to see how they keep this road open through some of the toughest winters the Rockies can create. Nature claims a high price for living and working in these mountains. Here's three plough drivers who have lost their lives working here and next to them a family of three who got swept off the road on Red Mountain Pass. This is Red Mountain Pass, the most frightening stretch of all on Highway 550. It's where I'm headed next. Silverton, southern outpost of the Colorado Department of Transport. Snowplows and snowblowers are starting another demanding shift. You need some big machines to deal with the elements here. I'm joining experienced plough driver Paul Wilson. We're heading up towards Red Mountain Pass on Highway 550, a road ripe with avalanches. Nice to meet you. My pleasure. Thanks for taking me out today. Ain't not a problem. This should be fun. Oh yeah. As we gain altitude, the snow starts to pick up. Wow, it's getting, getting heavy. Intensifying a little bit up here. Paul's taking me to a section of road where you pass an avalanche chute every 10 seconds. Not sure that getting out here is the wisest move. If you look down in this area down here, it's what we call the Brooklyn avalanche area. And there are 13 Brooklyn slides. And then we have the ditch, the double ditch, and the SOB here. And then up here in fact, there are more than 20 places an avalanche can hit you in this one mile stretch. But just as dangerous are the blizzards, which once almost cost Paul his life. Snowflakes are huge and you couldn't see it all. And I was feeling my way up with the wing on the ridge and all of a sudden the ridge was gone. Wow. When the ridge went, my front wheel went over and I knew I was going over at that point. So how far, how far did you get down? I rolled down about 600 feet. 600 feet. Yeah, so I crawled out of the truck and started climbing back up the bank to the road. I had a severe cut on 
my arm here and so that made it even harder to try to climb up the bank. Wow. And and hold this artery at the same time. I just I love how I love how um how relaxed you are about it all. <laughs> Men like Paul are often modest about their bravery. I've got to ask this, how big are your balls? <laughs> <laughs> They're huge. Yeah. <laughs> While Paul seems not to worry about the dangers he faces each day, other plough drivers are not quite so laid back. Dak Klein has been working here for seven years. I've got a lot of respect for this mountain now. Every inch of this road seems to have something dangerous that can come up and get you. And it's the avalanches that are the greatest threat, as Dak has experienced firsthand. You can see the avalanche coming, you're trying to gun it, and the hitting the side of the truck. It was, it was really scary. I mean, it was. I mean, thousands and thousands of pounds of snow barreling down at you at wow. speeds of over 100 miles an hour. And you don't hear much of anything. <laughs> That's, there's something really eerie about that. That night really did scare me. I didn't know what was going to happen. And didn't know if it was going to take my truck off the road, if it was going to bury me completely. And it wasn't something I want to go through again, ever. Zach knows he was lucky that night got a wife and three kids at home and just knowing that I mean something could happen where I could leave them and not be able to make it home is my biggest fear. I'm beginning to realize just how lethal avalanches can be. Let loose this force of nature just can't be stopped but can we somehow try to control it? A thousand miles northwest of Colorado lie the Cascades, a mountain range right on the border of Canada. In the high alpine forests is a place called Stevens Pass. A typical winter here can produce more than 500 inches of snow. On a brutal day of freezing sleet, I've come to see how Washington State's Department of Transport do battle in some very challenging avalanche terrain. Mike Stanford is the guy in charge of avalanche control. So Mike, what's so special about Stevens Pass? Uh, it's uh, one of the major highways through the Cascades from Seattle uh, to the east side, and so it's important to keep open during the winter. This is the highway, hundreds of feet above where we're standing. It's avalanche prone because it gets a lot of weather. It's mother nature. I mean, you know, she, we're just playing the game, she writes the rules. But he has an ace up his sleeve. That's the Mac Daddy. Look at that. Yes, this is real. It's a tank. Well, Mike, this is a big ass tank. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, uh, what sort of tank is this? This is an M60 A3. These guys use it to shoot at the mountainside. It's got a range of seven miles. Positioned at the base of Stevens Pass, the tank blasts avalanche zones above ensuring they don't threaten vehicles on the highway. So you fire at, at a specific spot where you're trying to release the tension and the, the shell goes in, what actually happens to the round and, and the snow around it? Uh, it? It pretty much gets blown to hell. So just up here? Yep, just climb up on her. First time on a tank. You don't really think about how big these things are until you see them in the flesh. Right, just pull that hatch all the way back. Yep, way back, all the way. God, it doesn't look very friendly in there. It's an incredibly tight squeeze. Oh, God. Okay, you go ahead and move, pull back, just roll your wrist back, and we'll pull the barrel up out of the travel lock. Yeah. And that was the travel lock falling down, so we'll okay. just come up a little more. Yeah. And you turn the wheel to the right, and we'll rotate to the right. That, that right, yeah. Now you know the turret's turning around. Whoa. And you can, and that pump will always go, it'll always uh, rotate. Yeah, you can just rotate around until you're locked onto a target on the mountain. Oh uh, yeah, okay, I got something I want to hit. I'm itching to shoot. Unfortunately, Mike won't let me. But the tank is not the only weapon in his armory. We've got an avalancher. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Well, uh, can I have a go at firing this? Oh, I guess. <laughs> the avalancher is a piece of artillery designed especially for tackling avalanches. Look at this. 
incredible. So how does this work? It uses compressed nitrogen. Uh, we fill the nitrogen up in these vessels to a certain PSI, yeah. and then we load the round in the back of the weapon here. Time to load her up. And what we'll do is we'll put about 160, 170 pounds in there. It's really boys with their toys, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. So right now this thing's armed and dangerous. Yep, uh, armed and dangerous, exactly. To shoot, we go to a position under the avalanche. Are we ready? Yep. Okay. All clear, ready to fire. Fire. Um, all clear, ready to fire. Oh, wow. That is seriously loud. Okay, that was a good <laughs> shot. That was fun. <laughs> oh, that sound is amazing. Yeah, a lot of, Let's do another a lot one. of rock, so it echoes a lot. Another one? Yeah, you bet. Let's do <laughs> it. A quick reload. Some careful reciting. So we aim it for that, that rock climber, right? Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> and checking to make sure we don't hit the overhead power lines. The Avalanche is primed and ready for another shot. All clear, ready to fire. Fire! That was amazing. <laughs> Good shot. Brilliant fun firing the Avalanche. But now I want to see this weapon actually bring down an Avalanche. Ready to fire, fire! That is awesome. <laughs> I've got some snow running. Look at that, you can just see how quickly it comes down the slope, and covers the road, heads down. Can you imagine that being 50 times the size? I mean, you just wouldn't want to be caught anywhere near that. Safety's off! An overnight dump of snow has given me the chance to catch a real avalanche control operation on this highway in southern Colorado. Ready to fire, fire! Wow. Now that was a display of firepower. With all the avalanche slopes cleared of danger, the Colorado Department of Transport get busy removing the snow that's blocking the road. This beast of a machine is a snowblower. It can blast away thousands of tons of snow per hour. It eats up the avalanche in no time. Keeping a state highway safe from avalanches is one thing. Protecting people once they leave the mountain roads is another. Dawn at Alta in Utah. Before the skiers hit the slopes at this high altitude resort, the very latest in avalanche control technology is going into action. This weird looking contraption carried by a helicopter is called a daisy bell. It's designed especially for inaccessible mountain peaks. As the chopper hovers over the target area, the Daisy Bell creates a high-powered blast of air, exploding a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen inside the bell. This shockwave clears the mountain slope of avalanche snow. The explosion's just gone off and you can see the uh, avalanche starting to form, just going down the mountainside right now. It's amazing. The Daisy Bell's work is finished and Delta's slopes are soon packed with skiers. When you leave the boundaries of controlled slopes though, the avalanche danger is much greater. Go out into the backcountry unprepared and you're risking life and limb. I love snowboarding in this kind of terrain. But it's clear I need to know a lot more about when and where an avalanche may strike. Especially as I'm going to be putting myself in harm's way. 
I'm like the Utah Avalanche Forecast Center. It's a bit like Mission Control. How you doing? Bruce, nice to see you. How are you? Very good, good thank you. you. Yeah. Former ski racer Bruce Tremper is one of a team of avalanche forecasters who study a complex mix of weather and snow data to produce a daily internet bulletin. His forecasts cover the backcountry, the thousands of miles of potentially dangerous terrain outside the controlled ski areas. As soon as you go outside of the boundaries of a ski resort, then you're stepping into the Stone Age. You know, you have to be your own avalanche expert and there's nobody to rescue you. So that's where we come in. We tell people exactly what kind of avalanches they're gonna find, how to recognize them, how to behave around them. Avalanche forecasters look for weak layers of snow on a mountain slope. New heavy snow falling on a weak layer spells danger, which is why Bruce spends a lot of time out in the Utah backcountry doing snow pit tests. Bruce, what's the, what's the purpose of digging this hole? Well, we're gonna look at the layers of snow because it's the weak layers that cause avalanches. Do some tests on them and this is a really good predictor of whether a person can trigger an avalanche or not. Straight down? Straight down. All the way? All the way. And then we'll just take the shovel, put it on top. Okay. And then just tap 10 times with your hand like this, just from your hand. Seems and then probably stable. let it drop from your elbow. And you see, it's starting to mush out right here. It's yeah, not it's really like it's... popping out. Yeah. Um, on a clean surface. Bruce is looking for a clean surface on this block of snow because it's the telltale sign of a weak layer. As winter passes, snow on a mountain slope builds up into layers. When a lower layer is weaker than the one on top, it can suddenly fracture. All it needs is the right trigger. When this happens, the layer above slides off into an avalanche. So an avalanche is going to occur on some weak layer in here. We're, we don't know which one it is, but this determines which one is the weakest and then how much force you have yeah. to add to make it a fracture. Bruce is like a snow guru. There's so much I can learn from him. For myself and, and a lot of people, snow is just this fluffy, playful thing that looks beautiful, can get you off school, you can do sports in it. But, but snow can be a, a very lethal element. I love snow. I love riding on snow. I love everything about snow, but it has a double-edged sword. It's very, very dangerous. If you get caught in an avalanche, um, you can easily be killed. The time when avalanche accidents occur are days exactly like today, the first sunny day following a storm, because sunshine makes people feel good, but the avalanche doesn't necessarily share your opinion. Who are the people most at risk of being caught in an avalanche? Uh, in the United States, it's primarily snowmobilers. And it's no wonder because snowmobiles can access any terrain that a skier or a climber or a snowboarder can. And you can do it very, very quickly. You can cover 100 times the amount of terrain that a skier can in a day on a snowmobile. And the more backcountry terrain you can get to, the more likely you are to enter a zone of potentially deadly snow. Stunning virgin snow like this is the holy grail of the snowmobile. I've joined some experienced snowmobilers for the day. These guys get their kicks exploring wild snow country. Guys, the run up here was incredible, and not only is it beautiful up here, it's a lot of fun. Why do you snowmobile? I just love coming up here for the camaraderie, the getting outdoors. I mean, you get the fresh air, you're at 10,000 feet, it just doesn't get any better. I mean, this is fantastic. January 2008, Arnie and his friends Dallas and Jeremy were part of a group snowmobiling near this pristine hill of snow. I saw that there was no tracks on the hill, so I decided, yeah, why not? So I started climbing up and I got about three quarters of the way and I could see ripples of snow. Then the unmistakable booming sound of a big avalanche. It's like thunder. It just, uh, the whole mountain just rumbles. And you can hear it echo throughout the whole canyon. 
And when I saw that, I knew that I needed to try to outrun it. In seconds, the avalanche had grown eight feet high and more than 1,000 feet wide, accelerating with frightening speed right at Jeremy. But it was just going so fast that it caught him. It was like a surfer on an ocean, surfing. The wave just came over the top of him and just engulfed him. His accelerator was flawed, 80 miles per hour. But the avalanche was faster. Snow was going over top of me and I couldn't see anything. And uh, I think I hit a big chunk of snow and it threw me off and I just slid down the hill on my back. Your friend's there one minute and then the next minute you look around and he's just gone. I mean, it's like, just vanished. The moment he's caught in the avalanche and you realize your friend's you know, under what, what was going through your heads. You know you're his only chance that he has to survive. I mean, you can't go for help and have anyone to get here in time. We're it. Crucially, they were ready for this kind of emergency. Jeremy was wearing an avalanche beacon. We turn our, uh, our beacons on to receive his signal. We all formed a line and we just scoured the, the terrain. Within 10 minutes, Dallas's beacon had locked on to Jeremy's signal. He should be right here, let's get the probe out. Although still conscious, Jeremy was completely buried under four feet of snow. And I tried to move, but there was no point. Couldn't, the only thing I could move was the toes of my boots. A few minutes more and they'd pinpointed Jeremy's body with probes. You hit him, right there. They dug furiously to get Jeremy out. Even if he had survived the trauma of the slide, he could last perhaps 15 minutes before he'd die of asphyxiation. Entombed by the avalanche, more than a ton of compacted snow had set fast around him. I could feel the snow push down on my chest and I couldn't breathe deep again. I had to take just light, light breaths after that because the snow was just packing me in there. He was fading fast. Finally, Dallas reached Jeremy's head. Jeremy, Jeremy, Jeremy! Gotta get the snow out. Jeremy's condition was critical. Well, he was not breathing. His face was gray, he was basically lifeless. After several minutes of CPR, Jeremy literally came back from the dead. His friend's swift actions had saved him. I owe him my life. If I wasn't here with him and just came up here by myself, nobody would have found me. After that experience, what have you guys learned about the power of snow? Be prepared. Have the uh, right equipment. Make sure you're wearing your beacon. Have probes, shovels. Know how to use them. Make sure you know how to use them, don't just have them. This snowmobiler's story rams home to me the dangers of the backcountry. The further you go out into this wild mountain terrain, the more likely you are to get struck by an avalanche. Backcountry skier Chris Harmson knows this all too well. He's experienced several avalanches and seen the tragic consequences many times. When you're moving in an avalanche, it's like being in liquid. It's like being in water. It flows just like water does. And you feel like you're swimming in it. But then once it stops, you're in cement. It, it sets up immediately and you can't move. And if you're buried more than six feet down, then the chances are no one will get to you in time. I've lost a number of friends to avalanches over the last 25 years. I've lost 20 friends to the mountains in wow. 25 years. That's just tragic. Six very close friends, and one of whom I was, I was present for when he was buried in his avalanche. In 1993, Chris was in Utah's Wasatch Mountains with a group of four expert skiers. They entered a steep chute high on the mountainside. Third down was his friend, Roman Lata. And I was right on the top, watching right straight down as he went down that slope. The snow fractured on both sides. And I just watched both of those leaves of, of snow just fold right in on top of it. An avalanche had swallowed him in an instant. Roman was buried very, very deep. He was two meters below the surface, long, long ways down. We stripped off all our gear, grabbed our shovels, and we started digging. And all four of us were digging as hard as we possibly could. When they found him, his heart had stopped, and he was rushed to hospital. He survived for three more days in the hospital 
when they disconnected life support because his brain activity was, was gone, basically. And he was brain dead at that point. It was a very, very traumatic experience for me. I, you know, I really learned a lot, I'm very, very saddened by that event. Um, and it's happened. Hearing that story, you know, people ski all the time and, and, and get caught in these situations. And your day can turn from the best day ever to your worst nightmare in a yeah. split second. Um, and, you know, I hope I never find myself in that situation. Sorry that you have, but I don't really know what to say, you know. Um, what, yeah. Uh. I've heard shocking accounts of avalanche accidents, but now I want to confront this force of nature head on. So I'm driving hundreds of miles to a remote mountain destination in Colorado. My plan is to carry out a special controlled experiment, trigger my very own avalanche with explosives. How dangerous is this stuff we got in front of us? Right now it's fairly stable, but we need to take it with a healthy respect. Obviously, once we get up there and the charges are armed, if they go off in our possession, then none of us go home tonight. I'm getting a crash course in explosives manufacture. Let's give this a go. Yeah. Ooh. Don't want to drop that. Yep. <laughs> no oops and explosives. That's a hefty amount of uh, explosives. This will be about a 40 pound, 45 pound shot altogether. Wow. So, yeah. And what could that take out? Probably a small building, um, easily. With two sets of explosives prepared, we load up the snowcat. And I get the chance to drive. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Right, turn her on. Ready? Just about. We're heading way out into the backcountry to a place where Chris and his team carry out avalanche controlled training operations. A stunning location. We're at nearly 13,000 feet. For my experiment, this dummy, as heavy as an average male, will be an avalanche victim. We're dragging him to a position on the slope that will maximize his chances of being buried. My test will be to rescue him as fast as possible, as in a real life or death situation. Time to set the explosive charges. Attention all mountain radios. Chicago Ridge will be conducting explosive testing on the heads wall for the next two hours. We're taking the explosives to a point right at the very crest of the slope. It was uh, quite scary walking down here. We're basically standing on the very top of what is potentially a massive avalanche. We pay out the detonation cord. Then, light the fuse. It's on a two and a half minute timer. Fire in the hole, three by five, heads wall. Two minutes, two minutes on heads wall. When you pull that cord, light the fuse, you know, you always run through your head what would happen if it went wrong. I just tensed up and I thought for a second, what if this is the last thought I have? We have 30 seconds till detonation. Oh God. I'm nervous. <laughs> Avalanche, there she goes. Wow, that was loud. Yeah. Did that slide. It did. Yeah. It did. It buried your friend down there. Okay, so the clock is ticking. You've got 15 minutes to get that person out of there. 15 minutes is the typical survival time for someone buried in an avalanche. We've got to move fast. First, I've got to lock onto our victim's beacon signal. There's tons of snow for me to scan. I think I got him, guys. All right, we're coming. Helping me are local skiers, Caleb and Jeff. Thank you, sir. Okay, that's the boundaries. Yeah, we got one, All right. one, one meter. Great, great. 
How you guys doing? Good, well, we're probing right now. You guys have been down five minutes. Your buddy doesn't have a lot of time. We've got a strike. Strike. All they right, did, we need shovelers right here. Start digging, find the probe. Follow the probe. Start downhill, there you go. There are huge, heavy slabs of snow to get through. We need to get them out fast. That's a lot of weight on the victim. Okay. That extra weight effectively cuts off 15 minutes down to just 10. Not much time to get to the victim's head. He's inverted, clear his head, clear his head, get his face out of the snow. Nope, dig out around his head. Dig out around his head. Get an airway for him. We're gonna have to get him out of the snow, rapidly. With less than a minute to go, we finally get our victim free. Excellent. Rescued in the nick of time. From the get-go, from the moment I set off to try and get my friend out of the snow, just the adrenaline is just flowing through your body. These things look light, but I can't explain to you how heavy these things are. I mean, there's hundreds of things going on at the same time. And in a real life situation, having your friend's life on the line is, is it would be the most traumatic experience ever. And um, I hope it's one I never have to go through. Rescuing someone from an avalanche is incredibly tough, but what's it actually like to be caught in one? It's just terrifying. You know, the slope shatters like a pane of glass and feels like somebody pulls a rug out from underneath you and then you're tumbling down the slope and the snow goes everywhere, down your underwear, under your eyelids, your hat gets ripped off, your mittens get ripped off. Um, and you're bouncing off of trees and rocks on the way down. You can't tell which way is up. And then when it finally comes to a stop, you're just encased in concrete. Canyon Ski Resort in Utah. This is where I'm going to test myself to the limit against the lethal power of winter. I'm going to be buried in snow that will replicate real avalanche conditions. It's one thing rescuing someone from an avalanche, but being buried in one yourself is a completely different matter. I'm about to find out just what that feels like. In this forest hideaway, something's being prepared for me. Hey, guys. How are you? Oh, a little bit nervous. Good. I'm meeting Chris Harmston again. He's built this snow chamber for my final challenge. It's where several feet of snow will be hard packed in on top of me. A team led by Dr. Colin Grissom, an expert in the science of avalanche survival, will be using me as a guinea pig. If you're buried in an avalanche, essentially statistics show you have 15 minutes to get out. But I'll be using this clever piece of avalanche survival technology, the Avalon breathing apparatus. The Avalon buys you um, a lot more time, two or three, four times that much time, depending on the uh, conditions. While I'm under the snow, the doctors will be constantly checking my heart rate, skin temperature, and the levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide in my body. The only reason why you need this much medical kit is if there's something dangerous going on, so... Um, yeah, it's uh, sort of bringing home to me the reality of what we're about to do. Peace. Wired up, I put my Avalon backpack on. Moment of truth, into the snow chamber. Okay, just go ahead and have a seat right there on that chair. A small camera and light sunk into the snow will enable everyone to watch me. Chris makes his final adjustments. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Copy that, we have readings. We're uh, good to go with everything. Okay. Radio's on so I can talk to the doctors. And in case I freak out from claustrophobia and they need to get me out quick. Then the shovels get to work. All right, guys, I think we're pretty much done. That's good enough. He's buried. All I can move are my toes. How long can I last down here? This is what it's like to be buried in an avalanche. 
five feet of hard-packed snow has settled around me like icy concrete. How will my body stand up to this ordeal? And that's 17 minutes of full burial uh, breathing on the Avalon. At this point, statistically, survival would drop to 30%. How long can I hold out? It's amazing, even if I try and slightly fight against it, there's just absolutely no movement. If I try and take a deep breath, I can feel the snow impacting on my lungs. My lifeline is this Avalon. Without it, I would by now be dead from asphyxiation. Overcome by the carbon dioxide, I breathe out, which the snow traps around my head. Slowly feel the, the cold creeping in to my skin and, and seeping slowly into my body. Starting to get the odd shiver. My aim is to endure a whole hour down here. It's as much psychological as physical battle. 45 minutes. The final phase of my test begins. They're digging down to me, but this is not the end. Now my life support is going to be taken away. Chris cuts the Avalon tube. So right now he's just breathing on the mouthpiece. Okay, Sam, I'm gonna cover you back up. Sealed back in for a few terrifying minutes, I'm going to experience an avalanche with no survival aid. It's like having a plastic bag over your head and trying to breathe. Two and a half minutes without the Avalon, my body's showing the stress. Right now, his uh, heart rate's going up, it's 93. His oxygen saturation is hanging in there, he's breathing and he's breathing faster. Breathing is now really hard as the carbon dioxide levels rise. Oh, yeah. He's breathing a lot harder. Yeah. Six minutes, alarm bells are ringing as my carbon dioxide goes critical. He's only gonna last another minute. Hang in there, it's gonna be about another 30 seconds and then we're gonna come get you. So 10 more seconds, 86, 85, 86. Five seconds. Okay, uh, 87, 85, 85. Turn on the oxygen. Okay, we'll start taking on everything 15 liters. 15 liters per minute. Oxygen is pumped in to stop me blacking out. And the diggers work like mad to get down to me. Man, you hear that sound, Make sure you sort of realize that you're not alone, I think. You're not alone, mate. We're on our way. Wow. Well, good job. Way to go. Way to hang in there. Oh, That's not an easy thing to do. As soon as I started to imagine being someone stuck under the snow and not knowing if someone was going to get them out, everything changed within literally a split second, and I started to feel, like, feel a lot more claustrophobic a lot more disorientated, kind of freaked out, and then I had to reassure myself that there's people to get me, oh. if need be. Basically, you were dying right there. You were on the, the verge of, of passing out and, and losing all the oxygenation in your blood. <laughs> I'm glad that's over. What an incredible journey I've had, traveling from sea level to 13,000 feet, driving over 3,000 miles. My eyes have been opened wide by the ingenuity and the courage used in the battle with winter. I felt the deadly power of snow take me to the very brink, and it's not something you ever want to experience. <laughs>